Hi, welcome to Westminster. We're really glad you're here. Well, got a little news to share with you. Um, Buren, our pastor, and his family are fighting the coronavirus right now. Some of you who are on our prayer chain may have seen that. Um, I know we'll be sending out more information about how that's going. Just look for it in your emails and any news that we might send. So please hold that family in your prayers and just realize that the threat is still out there for sure and we all have to stay careful and cautious and vigilant um, and do our best. So anyway, just hold them in your prayers, please. We appreciate that. Also wanted to let you know um, on the other side of things that we are still signing up. We are planning to do a safe outdoor worship here, masked and distanced um, on Easter. Just a shortened version of what our Easter service will be. We're also going to have the beautiful full version online um, on April the 4th. So if you'd like to sign up for one of those slots, you can do that online. So take a look at those links and get yourself signed up or you can call the church office too. And then uh, the other thing to keep bear in mind is that next week, um, starting next Sunday, will be the beginning of Holy Week and we'll have some special services in the middle of that week too. We will definitely have a Monday, Thursday service for you all to um, attend online. So those are all the things that we think you need to remember today. All right, let's continue with the worship of Almighty God.
God upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Therefore, let us confess our sin with every confidence that we will be lifted up. O oh God, drive us deep now to face ourselves, that we may see what we truly need to confess. We confess our capacity to deceive and willingness to be deceived, our loving of things and using of people, our struggle for power and shrinking of soul, our addiction to comfort and sedation God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, showing compassion to all. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. A reading from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the co covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord for I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no more. Good morning and welcome to Time with the Children. Can you say good morning? Good morning. You say hi. Hi. 
We are outside having lunch today and we want to talk to you about the third sign of hope. So our first sign was flowers, our second sign was water, and this week's sign is color. Yeah. So the other day we were at the grocery store and Lila picked out all these different flowers and we put them together. She picked out green and purple and pink and if you look really close at the green, there's even blue and white inside. And these flowers have been in our kitchen, ooh, and they make us so happy. Bright colors have made us so happy. So another place in our house where we have bright colors is right here. What are these? Easter eggs. Easter eggs. Can the, you say? <laughs> yeah. The other day, Lila and Jack dyed some Easter eggs, and we had so much fun doing it. But um, it's kind of confusing because we know the Easter Bunny brings <laughs> eggs, but bunnies don't lay eggs. Then why are Easter eggs full of candy, and what does that have to do with Easter? Um, but what we know about Easter eggs is that eggs are a sign of new life. So if you look in a bird's nest, you might see a baby bird, or an egg inside, and inside that egg is a baby bird. What's a baby bird say? Tweet, tweet. Tweet, tweet. And the baby bird inside, inside is a sign of new life. So eggs have babies inside, and it's a sign of fresh starts and new life. And that's what Easter is all about, because when Jesus died right before Easter and he rose again, it was new life for him, it was new life for all of us as Christians. Luckily, these are made out of paper, so we can't break them. Um, so Easter eggs, when you see them, I hope that you think about a little bit more than candy. I hope you think about new life and the fresh start that Jesus gave us. Um, in the spring colors, as you look around in the world, I hope you see bright colors like these flowers and these eggs. Be on the lookout for bright spring colors and fresh starts in God. Okay, you guys want to say a prayer? Oh, and I hope you'll come to our Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday. We're going to have tons of plastic Easter eggs to celebrate new life too. All right, you guys say a prayer with me. Ready, sis? Dear God, thank you for the hope of spring, new life, bright colors, and new life in you. Thank you for all these blessings. Amen. Yeah. You say amen? Amen. Bye-bye. Jack, say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hebrews chapter five, verses five through 10. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order, order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek.
John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was growing up, my family never missed a Sunday service or Sunday school, ever. There was no point in arguing about it. We tried, but in the words of Star Trek, resistance was futile. I do have some great memories, and I learned a lot of valuable lessons, of course. In fact, you know, probably exactly what brought me to this job at Westminster. But there are also some really random and weird moments, too. In one Sunday school class, a very nice older man, you know, one of those heroes who agrees to teach children Sunday school, he brought in his favorite painting. And here it is. He told us this was how he imagined Jesus looks. Friendly, vital, happy, and strong. He reminded us that Jesus was a carpenter and that wood was heavy and the work was outside. So Jesus had to be strong not weak and pale like the usual Sunday school picture of Jesus you'd see. The John scripture that Catherine just read for today, it reminds me of this painting. Jesus was confident and undaunted about what was about to happen in Jerusalem. In John's account, Jesus doesn't ask God to let the cup pass from him. There's no doubt and there's no fear. He says, the hour has come. His ministry had been building up to this moment, and he faced that moment without hesitation. Jesus goes on to say, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Jesus knew this was the culmination of his ministry on earth, and he was ready for the Son of Man to be glorified. And through death and resurrection, he would draw all people to himself. And Jesus was talking about all people, the entire world. I love this generous universal language. You hear it a lot in John. Probably the most famous example of that is in John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The beginning of this scripture has another one of those universal moments. Greeks come to the disciples, and they say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. These Greeks, who were Gentiles and foreigners, had likely found out about the raising of Lazarus, and they wanted to see and maybe even perhaps follow the person behind this miracle. Hasn't that been the theme? Throughout this pandemic time, we wish to see Jesus. For as Buren said on Christmas Eve in his sermon, how do we find Jesus in this mess? It's kind of hard to believe, but this is the last Sunday in Lent. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, which marks the beginning of Holy Week. 
Throughout this pandemic, Odyssey, time has been this elusive mix of when will this ever end? And wow, was that 11 months ago that we all sent those videos of waving palms? It seems like yesterday. So many things seem out of step and different. We're worshiping in a new way and it can be difficult to try to nurture our scattered community and maybe even ourselves. It sometimes seems like we have been in constant Lent for the last year, like we've been waiting for the good news in the midst of illness, job loss, death, and rampant injustice. How can we bear one more thing? Thankfully, we're beginning to see some hopeful improvements, like vaccinations, but we know we still have a ways to go. Can you imagine if a prophet had shown up and predicted the difficulties we all, I mean, all of us, the whole world, would have to navigate this past year? I think that might have made the waiting even more difficult to know that ahead of time. In our Old Testament scripture, Jeremiah was that guy, the one who had, who knew the bad things that were coming, and God sent him to Jerusalem to warn the Israelites that because they continued to break the covenant, and they were doing things like worshiping idols and treating the poor unjustly, among other things, God would send an enemy, Babylon, to destroy the temple and conquer Israel. As you can imagine, most of the book of Jeremiah is dark and basically hopeless. The scripture for today took place well into the book after much suffering. Israelites were under siege from the Babylonians. Families were fractured and separated. Many were homeless, all were scared, and all were vulnerable. Still, Jeremiah's message that we read today manages to be one of hope. It's God's promise of a new covenant. Our God, who wanted to stay in relationship with God's people, would write the new covenant on their hearts instead of on stone tablets. God was and is so persistent relentlessly persistent. God found a way to stay in relationship with the people. This covenant would remain with them wherever they were, wherever they went. And just to remind you, here's the covenant. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Can you imagine the day when people know God in the depths of their heart, where love, kindness, and justice is realized because it's just who we are? And it's nothing that has to be taught. It happens naturally. Well, I don't think we're there yet but I do think we see glimpses of it. Occasionally we get it right, and occasionally against all odds we're able to demonstrate unconditional love in our actions. When I was a sophomore in high school, our football team managed to get into the playoffs. Well, this was Texas. So we had to a big bus ride of two and a half hours to a little town called Wichita Falls. We were playing Odessa Permian, which is that school from Friday Night Lights. It's so good. Well, I was in the band, and that meant we had an extra long day of travel and practice. Well, you probably guessed this, but we got trounced. I mean, it was embarrassing. We didn't even score a point. I remember after the game, we were sitting on the stuffy school bus, tired and caught in a gridlock in the parking lot of people trying to leave. The windows were open and some rowdy Odessa boys saw our bus marked Denton ISD and they started laughing and yelling taunts and insults directly at us. No one yelled back, although we muttered that we wanted to. <laughs> the boys continued hurling their insults and then our funny sweet majorette actually stuck her head out of the window and she said, don't do that. It hurts our feelings and makes you sound petty and mean. Come on, we're better than that. Well, we all held our breath. And after a beat, one boy shouted back. And he said, you're right. You're pretty cool. And they walked off. 
Those perfect moments are rare. I feel we're still looking forward to a time when unconditional love is written on our hearts and our go-to response is compassion, generosity, and love. I'm not sure we're there yet. Some days it's hard to have hope that the covenant will be realized. Some days our hearts are hiding in fear or broken from the news of another tragedy or personal loss. Some days our hearts are hardened because we don't think we can take any more. This week has felt like that with the Atlanta shootings. We wish to see Jesus. Our Hebrew scripture today addresses a different way to see Jesus. Until this week, I was not very familiar with this verse that compares Jesus to a high priest, probably because it's not part of our tradition or part of our practice. But a high priest would intercede with God on behalf of humanity. Hebrews points out that Jesus chose to understand our suffering and suffer with us. On our behalf, Jesus offered up our prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Hebrews says he learned obedience through what he suffered. This isn't obedience like do what I say. It's active obedience. Where Jesus experienced suffering as a human and therefore he understands our suffering. It is having obedience and strength to do the right thing. Obedience to do the loving thing and the difficult thing. I mentioned Atlanta. I know our hearts are heavy with sympathy for the families and victims of this latest hate crime. I know many of us have prayed with loud cries and tears, seeing how hate continues to kill our brothers and sisters of color. We wish to see Jesus. In this month's issue of Christian Century, Reverend Catherine Willis Pershey of Western Springs Congregational Church near Chicago. She responded this way. She said, this is how Christ heals. He bears with us, for us. Every tragedy, every anxiety, every rough edge and broken promise. He bears the sin and he bears the pain. We do not need to question where God is in times of suffering. God is right there in the center of it. We wish to see Jesus. Our church is committed to social justice, and I'm sure that we will continue to find ways to stand with our brothers and sisters who are bearing the scars of discrimination. I'm sure we will be persistent in our actions to feed the poor, fight for justice, and nurture and love all of God's creation. We wish to see Jesus. One story of obedience that occurred during the Atlanta tragedy that's been in the background this week is that the parents of the disturbed man who committed these crimes, they actually turned him in. He'd been absent from their lives for over a year, but they recognized him on the security camera footage that the TV station sent out to the Atlanta area. They then called the police and the police tracked him down by his phone, arrested him and ended the rampage. That action of obedience from his parents had to have been painful and next to impossible. And it undoubtedly saved lives. Throughout this difficult past year, I've found that if I pay attention, I can almost always see Jesus and the fruit of his love. Here are some places I saw Jesus this week. I saw Jesus when one friend took her recently recovered friend on her first car ride to see the church's beautiful daffodils. I saw Jesus when two days of this week, two days of this spring break week, our youth used their vacation time to help Westminster members. I saw Jesus when two days of this spring break week, Westminster members lavished amazing hospitality on our youth and appreciated them for a job well done. And I saw Jesus and persistent hope in your enthusiastic response to our outdoor masked and distanced Easter gathering that's coming shortly. My friends, 
even in these tedious last days of Lent, when we're not sure we can take it anymore, I invite you to take a moment and see the light of God's love. It's right here in our hearts, written on our hearts, all of our hearts, wherever we go. God is with us these days and beyond, and God's strength will see us through. Hallelujah and amen. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in God. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with the good. Our prayer for the people for today is inspired by a thoughtful prayer written by Keith Dove, an intern at First Presbyterian, Greensboro, North Carolina. It is a prayer making, marking one year of COVID-19. Please join me in prayer. We lament our year of sickness, God who both forms light and creates darkness. We saw our world covered with sickness, and that sickness continues yet. Heal us, those we love, and all who have been afflicted, that we may all be restored. We lament our year of death. God of eternal life, we saw our world plagued by the shadow of death. Give comfort to those who mourn, those whom we know and those whom we do not, that we may all find hope in your promise of resurrection. We lament our year of isolation. God of table and feasting together, our homes are lonely and we have been unable to welcome guests in. Sustain us with hope for crowded tables where there is room and enough for all that we may once again experience communion together and have a taste of the banquet in your kingdom that is yet to come. We lament our year of worshiping apart. God of community and communion, we miss our worshiping together in this restful and inspiring space. We are anxious to gather and experience in-person fellowship and worship with one another. Draw us together once more with a renewed vision of what your community should and could be, that we may experience earth as it is in heaven. We lament our year where injustices becoming even more stark and obvious. God of justice and righteousness, we have seen the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and widespread unemployment. We have watched our neighbors of color die in the streets and in workspaces, 
and we continue to hear the anguished cries of justice. We are struggling to endure division and hatred and struggling to respond to our neighbor's needs. Instill in us a vision of your kingdom where all are safe and have enough and give us strength to persistently co-labor with you until justice and peace is accomplished. We celebrate the light we see in the darkness, God of new life and resurrection. We celebrate that we can now see an end to the sickness, death, and isolation. We are thankful for the global community that has worked together to bring about vaccines, for the essential workers who have cared for us, and for all the ways that we have seen neighbors to each other. As a city, as a country, and as a world, Teach us to walk together in your way of righteousness and peace. And as we move closer to the passion of Christ, may your love be written on our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you go through this week before Holy Week, I invite you to see the love and be the love of Jesus in the world. I invite you to feel God's strength taking you wherever you go. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>